it, it starts from understanding why patients don't follow physician advice when it comes to implementing therapies, treatments. And um, there are two reasons why people sometimes do not take what uh, we prescribe. Uh, the first reason is they just don't want to. And there may be a number of underlying reasons for them not wanting to take pills. Uh, they may find them unnecessary, they may want to um, get better on their own, or they may want to use natural remedies, or they may just not trust that the pill will help them. Uh, and that's just a separate group. Another group of patients are working very hard at uh, doing everything that we've told them will help them. And uh, there comes a break point where everything that we've asked them to do, to include taking pills, monitoring their sugars, their blood pressure, their weight at home, coming to see us as well as other specialists and nurses and dietitian and other, uh, other uh, people that could provide them advice, doing all that takes so much time and effort that they just can't do it. They have to also be, you know, family members and uh, productive members of society. They have to work, they have to engage with uh, other things, not just healthcare. And so it just gets to be too much for them to implement, to make it work. So they stop doing certain things. Now what they stop doing may or may not be the most or least important part of their therapy. They may not have the information. And because uh, patients usually don't like to disclose what they're not doing to their clinicians, clinicians oftentimes don't know that the patient has stopped some potentially important pill, for instance. When they come to see us next time, we check their sugars, we check their blood pressure, we check cholesterol, they're not at goal. What do we do? We, we intensify the therapy, we give them more to do. Um, you can see how this will, you know, get more complicated and the patient may even be more challenged to do this. So, um, now that is if there was just one clinician. But imagine a patient with multiple medical conditions, like it's very common these days, and these patients actually have um, a number of doctors that they need to see, and each one is working and intensifying the therapy to achieve each of their, the goals of their diseases. The end result for the patient could be completely uh, 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 unimaginable. And we have patients that take medications 12 times a day. We have patients that have 11 different visits uh, in a given month. Um, uh, and, and these patients are barely making it and, uh, and we need a different, a different way of practicing medicine for them. So with my collaborators, what we've uh, come up with is the idea of designing the treatment programs for these patients around the patient's goals for healthcare. Um, do they want to live longer, feel better, live unhindered by uh, the complications of their disease or of the treatments that we're giving them? And sometimes those goals go together and it's easy. Sometimes there's conflict. Uh, feeling better may mean not being able to live longer and vice versa. Uh, and so we need to discuss this and prioritize this with the patient, but then we need to coordinate all the recommendations that the patients are maybe getting from a number of different clinicians. So they need, to be in, in, uh, they need to be in an integrated healthcare system where we can integrate it for them, coordinate it for them. Maybe uh, some people have heard about the idea of the medical home in primary care. Well, that sort of idea will help us implement this um, and coordinate it for the patient. The idea will be to design uh, treatments that achieve the goals of the patient to a good enough extent and at the same time do it uh, in a way that minimizes the burden of treatment for the patient, how much difficult it is for the patients to implement these treatments uh, in their lives. Uh, right now, clinicians have no way of assessing the burden of treatment. There's no measurement of that. There's no way of knowing except through conversation. And as a result, there is no way of really uh, uh, becoming aware of how difficult it is for the patient to implement everything that every healthcare provider has asked them to do. As a result, patients are going through our system um, with uh, not being compliant with our therapy, sometimes because they don't want to, sometimes because they can't. And uh, we treat them both as if they were the same. Um, take, for instance, the case of a patient with coronary artery disease. Um, they have their somewhat shorter breath. They take medications for heart failure and to avoid having chest pain. Um, those patients have, that patient has diabetes and uh, was taking a couple of tablets to bring their sugars down. Um, when they come to the visit, we notice that their sugar, these patient's sugars are out of control, they're, they're too high, and the patient probably has some symptoms of high blood sugars. 
So we intensify the therapy uh, by asking them to take an additional tablet and monitor the blood sugars more often. Uh, perhaps we ask the patient to monitor the sugars before breakfast and before the evening meal on a daily basis. We have the patient meet with our diabetes educator or dietitian to tighten those things and then we ask the patient to come back say in two months or three months. Um, so right there we, we increase the amount of work the patient has to do. The, um, the patient comes back the next time and they have not been successful. This is a real patient and when this patient actually met with the pharmacist because at that point we send the patient to the pharmacist because she would now had a, lot, a large number of medications and we wanted to make sure that the, these were all uh, sensible. The pharmacist was able to look at pharmacy records and look at refills. The challenge, the reason why her sugars were not well controlled is that the second medication that was added was actually quite expensive and the patient was never able to afford that medication so she never filled that prescription. So when, when we noticed that the sugars were not well controlled uh, we intensify the therapy and ask, and add, added another pill, this one also quite expensive, which the patient also was not able to fill. So by uncovering that, we noticed that our, our intensification of therapy failed because the regimen that we had created was, did not fit the patient's context. The patient could not afford this. By bringing the patient back, uh, we were able to then re uh, redesign the diabetes component of her program so that it will better fit her context. We use inexpensive generic medication. We space out the, the testing. Instead of testing every day, twice a day, we ask the patient to test in the mornings you know, only three times a week. And over a period of a month or two, we had enough numbers to actually look at trends. We did the same with the afternoon. So the number of, of checks, which 70 cents a check, you know, a blood sugar check is not inexpensive. So we were able to reduce the overall cost of her care. Now, we also changed the goal of her diabetes uh, care. We didn't want to normalize her blood sugars. In fact, in part because we knew that uh, this could be dangerous to her given her coronary artery disease. Uh, we actually decided with her that the main goal initially was to bring her sugars down to the point where she was not having symptoms from it. And so this is not optimal by current guidelines, but it's good enough for her. We're helping her be successful as a patient, manage to implement a few things that will make her feel better. Uh, will that make her live longer? Maybe not, uh, but that will may, maybe be a secondary goal. In, in a, as we discuss with the patient, we may prioritize that later. Right now, the priority was to make her feel better and to make her successful in terms of having some control over her conditions. Uh, that required going for good enough and then designing the treatment so that it will not interfere so much with her life, in this case with her economics. One of the reasons why this sounds counterintuitive is that the quality parameters have been decided and designed on a disease by disease basis. Um, and they work okay if you only have one or two conditions. Once you start accumulating multiple conditions, um, this, these parameters become much more difficult to implement for the patient. So what sounds okay for that disease, when put together with all the other ones, becomes overwhelming. Um, so closing the quality gap on a disease by disease basis seems quite reasonable and a, and a good objective. But when you turn that into practice and you try to implement it as a patient, it may end up being impossible. And it may end up causing more harm uh, than good. And, uh, and you as a patient notice that and you start cutting back. And now all of a sudden you are a uh, non-compliant patient uh, that is actually not helping your clinician look good at the time when the quality assessment comes along. What what will make more sense is if our quality parameters were patient-centered in some way that needs to be determined. It's uh, open for research, but we need to start defining quality through the patient's eyes and not through the disease uh, standpoint. Once we do that, 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 that uh, conflict, I think, will disappear.